Hello and welcome to another video of the Structure Meta series. Here we explore the importance of protein structure and introduce different biophysical techniques. My name is Jan Schäfer and I'm a field application scientist at Redshift Bio. And today we go over FTIR spectroscopy and protein secondary structure. But why do we care about the secondary structure of proteins? Well, because secondary structure directly relates to the protein's activity, as local structural changes can, for example, close binding pockets or remove catalytic sites from their designated position. In addition, it is an ideal reporter on aggregation, since proteins often show substantial structural changes when they aggregate. And last, secondary structure also provides assessment of protein stability and biosimilarity. This picture shows the electromagnetic spectrum all the way from the low energy radio waves up to the high energy gamma rays. In the center, we find the visible range indicated by the rainbow colors. Next to the low energy end on that visible spectrum, you can find the infrared region, which is used in FTIR. It ranges from about 10 to roughly 12.500 wave numbers and is divided into the near, mid and far infrared region. Generally speaking, IR light probes vibrations of molecules or certain functional groups. Specifically, the mid infrared range from 400 to 4000 wave numbers is often used for protein analysis, as it also covers the fundamental vibrations of protein backbones, known as the amide 1 and amide 2 bands. Mid-infrared FTIR spectrometer typically use glow bars as a light source, which can cover the entire mid-IR region. Unlike dispersive instruments, FTIR spectrometer are built in form of an interferometer, shown here on the left-hand side. In such a setup, the light is sent onto a 50% beam splitter, which sends one portion onto a fixed and the other on a moving mirror. Afterwards, the reflected beams get recombined and sent through the sample towards the, det the detector where they interfere. The recorded data are a so-called interferogram, which is presented here on the lower right. It shows a main signal in the center, which is where both arms of the interferometer have the same length and the beams interfere constructively. As we go away from the center, the signal decreases. This is because the arm length are increasingly different and the interference becomes more and more deconstructive. There are three major advantages of such a setup over dispersive instruments. The first is the so-called multiplex advantage, which means that there is no frequency scanning required since the whole spectral information are contained in the interferogram. But increasing L, so the range of the moving arm, increases the spectral resolution. This means a higher signal to noise for a given scan time or a shorter scan time for a given resolution. The second is the so-called throughput advantage, which essentially means that the loss of light in the instrument is reduced by a factor of 200. The third one is the so-called cones advantage, which was a critical development in FTIR. Sending a helium neon laser beam alongside the main beam allows to determine the motion of the moving arm more accurately, which gives rise to a spectral resolution of up to one thousandth of a wave number. In the following slide, I'm going to show you how FTIR spectrometer are used to generate absorption spectra. First, we have to record an interferogram of your sample as well as the corresponding background. The analytical software then performs a Fourier transformation of them, which provides us with two absorption spectra. At the end, the background spectrum is subtracted from the sample spectrum, and we end up with the absolute absorption spectrum of the sample. Typical infrared absorption bands of various types of bonds are presented here in this figure and they can all be used for understanding the structure and composition of your sample. 
But for protein analysis, the most relevant bands are the so-called MI1 and MI2 bands, which appear between 1500 and 1700 wave numbers. Both of those vibrations stem from the protein backbone, and they are therefore reporter for the protein's secondary structure. Therefore, FTIR is not only a non-invasive, but also a label-free method for protein structural analysis. In principle, both MI1 and MI2 can be used to deconvolve the relative abundance of secondary structural motifs. Typically, both bands are used for protein analysis, since they both have their pros and cons. The MI1 band has a higher overall intensity, and the bands from different structures are more spread out in frequency. On the other hand, MI1 also overlaps with a water band, so perfect background subtraction is crucial, especially for low concentration samples. A general advantage of FTAR is its flexibility. It covers a broad frequency range, and so the whole mid-IR region can be used for various types of applications and is not limited to proteins. Often, FTIR instruments are capable of performing temperature ramps and kinetic experiments. I would like to finish here by giving you a summary about what FTIR does and does not provide for protein analysis. First of all, FTIR offers a broad range of applications, as it covers the whole IR range. The IR active vibrational modes can be used as a reporter for studying molecules of interest. For protein analysis, it typically uses the MI1 and MI2 band in the mid-IR region to identify the relative abundance of secondary structures. What FTIR does not do is determine the protein size. It does not provide information about which part of the protein sequence forms which secondary structural motifs. And finally, it does not give you a direct information on the three-dimensional arrangement of those secondary structural motifs. This concludes our introduction to FTIR spectroscopy. Thank you for watching this video. Again, I'm Jan, and if you want to learn more about other biophysical tools, check out more videos on our Structure Matters website. Take care.